I'm really happy to welcome Karsten Donai to our AITR Invited Speaker Series. Uh, as Jack mentioned, uh, Karsten is an Assistant Professor of Computational Social Sciences at the University of Constance, and he has recently joined the University of Zurich as an Assistant Professor for Political Behavior and Digital Media. And this is as part of the university's new Digital Society Initiative, which uh, Karsten will also talk a little bit about. Uh, Karsten is a truly interdisciplinary scientist. He has uh, studied physics in Munich and then he obtained his PhD in computational social sciences from ETH Zurich. And he has contributed in uh, many international multidisciplinary um, research projects of high impact uh, in the field of computational social sciences in Germany, Switzerland, Canada and US. Uh, in his work, he uses statistical and computational methods on large-scale geocoded data of online human interactions to gain insights, for example, or how they will affect pol political behavior. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Carson was supposed to be here in person, but because of the recent guidelines, uh, we have to do this talk virtually. Uh, but uh, today we will have to pleasure, the pleasure to, list, uh, to hear Karsten talk about his research on a very current and very important topic, namely fake news, uh, detecting and revealing biased news coverage, which is also potentially very interesting for uh, TR as well. And with this, I would like to welcome, uh, welcome you, Karsten, and thank you for being here. And I will uh, give you the floor for your talk. Thank you very much, Laura. I hope everybody can uh, hear me okay. Um, thanks a lot for the very kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Jack uh, and Laura, for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy uh, you're interested uh, in my work. And I'd like to use the next about 30, 35 minutes or so to introduce a project that I'm pursuing together with Bela Gipp, who is a professor of computer science at the University of Wuppertal in Germany. So all of the work I'm presenting here is always joint work and I'll uh, credit everybody who was involved in the end uh, separately. So fake news detecting revealing biased news coverage is the topic for today. But Before I jump into that, I just want to give you a very quick introduction about the background of my current work. So I just now start at the University of Zurich officially on April 1st. And I'm one of the first uh, professors that are hired there for the new Digital Society Initiative, which is an interdisciplinary competence center on digitalization. Um, I think this is particularly interesting maybe for the colleagues in Switzerland, but maybe also more broadly because the ambitions of the DSI are relatively uh, lofty. Um, what we're interested in is uh, several challenge areas related to communication, e-health, uh, uh, communities, work, uh, also e-work, which is, I think, becoming very, very important uh, these days uh, in face of the corona crisis. Um, I'm particularly involved in the module on democracy. Uh, I'm part of the so-called Dem Digital Democracy Lab, which is led by Fabrizio Gelardi, who is a professor at the University of Zurich. Um, and we are looking at political implications of digital technology. Uh, and we have researchers involved from ETH Zurich, UZH, uh, and Hattie School of Governance in Berlin. And what we're providing right now is a research infrastructure for data collection analysis, mostly for online data. But moving forward, we also have now a call for um, non-resident fellowships, and we'll have conferences and workshops all in the area of digitalization uh, in political science or in politics more broadly. I already mentioned uh, I'm one of the new DSI professors. There will be 16 in this first round of hiring. Um, my home is in the Department of Political Science, um, but I'm affiliated with this interdisciplinary uh, center. And as you already heard from Laura, my background it's, uh, itself is very uh, broad. So I think I found a very nice uh, home there. Um, I want to start us off with a general introduction kind of, of where I'm coming from in terms of this work. And um, I mean, as you can see kind of in this pictogram, the framing of news really matters, right? It matters uh, what we focus on in the coverage of an event. It matters how exactly it is covered. And I brought a few examples just to, to highlight this point. Uh, you've probably all heard it, kind of the labeling of uh, freedom fighters versus terrorists in the Crimean crisis or the war in Iraq versus the war on Iraq. I don't know if you've seen that, but in the co coverage of Hurricane Katrina, 
Uh, there was uh, some coverage where white people are finding uh, things in stores while black people are looting. So it's uh, a very similar incident described in quite different normative terms. And uh, you might have also seen something similar in terms of uh, the pictorial dis uh, description or the, the images that come alongside the news articles. So those are uh, two images from the GC7 summit 2014 of a meeting between Barack Obama and uh, President Putin. And uh, just depending on which image you, you pick, it seems like this is a very productive meeting versus uh, a really bad uh, uh, meeting. So really the framing of news matters. I'm, I think I'm not telling you anything new, but I just wanted to uh, get you started with that. So how do we see this a little bit more broadly? Because I, I led the talk with the topic of uh, fake news. Um, the way we see this more generally is kind of you're on a two axis versus news veracity versus uh, the framing of the news. Are they neutral versus biased? Uh, is the uh, coverage factual versus false? And kind of uh, ideally news wires kind of fall in the lower left hand corner. It's relatively neutral coverage uh, and it's very factual, whereas fake news are in the upper corner. They're mostly uh, delivered in a very biased fashion and their faults. And I brought a, just for completeness, I brought a definition. And um, where the normal news cover mostly kind of takes place is somewhere in the factual range. And there is always a variation in how neutral the coverage is. And I mean, this is intrinsic uh, to the, we, the way that news are made. Um, I just want to emphasize here, this is not meant in any form normative. So uh, whether neutral is better or a bias, so having an opinion about a topic is better. It's just about whether or not uh, the presentation is just factual or whether there's actually opinions uh, mixed under uh, in the presentation. And uh, what I'll be talking about today basically falls into this lower half, but we are also working uh, in future work on actually really extending it to the fake news uh, segment. Um, it turns out that the task of uh, recognizing just uh, the framing of news versus actually recognizing Very fake nice. news is a little bit different because uh, fake news is also uh, structurally different. So I, have a, uh, I have a project together with Princeton, uh, Jake Shapiro and his team, and there we are combining kind of the content-based things I will be talking about today with more structural measures of recognizing uh, fake news campaigns uh, online. So there's a lot of relevant academic research on this topic, of course, and some of this goes way back. Um, and uh, since this project is actually between the social sciences and the computer sciences, I already mentioned uh, Ila Gibb, the professor I work with, uh, is a computer scientist. I'm here representing the social science direction. Uh, I wanted to briefly just touch on some of the relevant academic work that has been done in this area. And in the social sciences, uh, this work goes back to the even the 50s, 60s, about selection, omission of news topics, uh, how news framing actually impacts the perception of readers, uh, the political relevance of this kind of news coverage. So does it actually influence uh, real world political processes, uh, reader perception, more broadly social influence online and also offline? And more recently, information echo chambers on digital media. Um, the flip side, sorry, before I, before I go to the computer science part, I just want to very briefly um, kind of uh, take a main, um, take, uh, present a main takeaway from this, which is uh, kind of our conceptual model of the news production process. This is uh, a dis dis distilled version of uh, the research so far that kind of looks at different constraints. So how do political views, ideology, the target audience, but also kind of more business constraints, like who is the owner of a news producers, uh, the advertising market, or even governments, so rules and regulations, how they actually impact decisions on how news are uh, presented. Uh, this starts with fact selection, uh, then goes to the actual writing style, the presentation style, uh, which is something we're not uh, looking at right now, but which is really important, uh, especially in online uh, media. And then, of course, how it's perceived by the co consumers is not independent of uh, the pr uh, prior health beliefs or attitudes, social status, country, 
and cultural factors. So just when I talk about uh, kind of the impact of uh, different presentation of the news, just I want you to keep this big uh, conceptual uh, map in mind where you kind of have the relationship between what is the motivation on the side of the news producers, uh, the decisions they have to make in presenting the news and then how does this affect uh, how uh, the consumers how the news readers actually perceive uh, a coverage of a topic so the flip side is uh, in computer science uh, there has been in the last 10 15 years a lot of very technical work but this work is largely disconnected from the insights that already existed in the social scientists sciences uh, a lot of these um, techniques are quite generic uh, they're not just uh, applied to this topic. I mean, NLP, machine learning, deep learning, computer vision are much broader uh, techniques, but they've also been applied specifically to the analysis of news. Uh, similarly, a lot of people uh, automatically collect uh, news data online. Uh, they detect uh, models inside of uh, news or inside social media posts. Uh, they try to automatically detect events. Or more recently, people have really looked also in text reuse, including text reuse in news articles. So how does factual information actually get uh, kind of through the news wire into the news article and then maybe even into other news articles by other outlets? And uh, like I mentioned, these two research fields have been largely disconnected in the past. Now, there is a very particular motivation for this project, which comes actually from some of my uh, very political science uh, research I've done recently. And that is, uh, we focused on a very particular type of uh, framing, which is uh, framing by word choice and labeling. And I'd like to just illustrate what I'm talking about. Uh, the first one is uh, these kind of labels that you've seen previously. So are you calling somebody freedom fighter, are you calling a terrorist, uh, or maybe you're just calling them an assailant, uh, immigrant versus economic migrants, undocumented immigrants versus illegal aliens. And those are all terms uh, and terminologies that are uh, coming from the uh, news coverage of uh, real world events. In contrast, uh, we have also word choice. So you already saw one example of this, the war in Iraq versus the war uh, on Iraq, which is, uh, Substantial, uh, substantively different in, in the way that's perceived. Maybe a little bit more subtle is the other example of the coverage of the Iraq war in 2003, where you kind of see uh, the first one as a very neutral presentation, uh, withdrawn to you to reconnaissance planes and the other ones as a much more um, threatening description of the same event. Um, and here it's not through the use of an explicit label, but it's through the subtle word choice and the choice of how exactly that event is uh, described. And of course, those are stylized examples. You can imagine in the real world, there's uh, very different flavors of this and also mixes of the two. What we've done actually is uh, we've tried to un unravel this a little bit and we ran a uh, online experiments with American citizens where we presented them with news text and asked about uh, how threatening uh, they perceived the described incident to be. And what was very interesting is that uh, the obvious kind of labels we used, they were recognized uh, and they didn't really lead to an increase in threat perceptions. Whereas when we just use bias and negative language to describe the events, people were not aware of it and they were influenced in their threat perception. So for an identical, otherwise identical description of the incident, otherwise identical incident, uh, people thought that they were much more uh, threatening just because they were described in a negative language. Uh, there's a second part to the story, which is that when you actually ask people about whether or not the coverage is neutral, they're able to recognize uh, that the uh, coverage uh, that uses very negative words is not neutral. And they think that the journalists who wrote this are biased, but uh, this is only after you really trigger them uh, to uh, reflect on this. So this tells you a little bit that uh, the subtle word choice that people don't necessarily recognize unless asked about versus clearly recognizable labels actually have a different effect on how events, or how news uh, events, how they're described are perceived by the readers. Now, the contribution of this project in particular um, is trying to link uh, these social science insights with the computer science techniques. And that's why we have formed this particular interdisciplinary team. 
And uh, we do this uh, in two pillars, which correspond to uh, the substantive uh, focuses of our two groups. So one is the social science one, where we test the impact of readers' perceptions. Um, so this is really about like when I deliver the news, how do the people listening to the news uh, perceive this? Versus uh, the computer science part of it, which is about the automatic classification uh, of the degree of bias uh, in news coverage. And I'm going to talk about both of them today, a little bit longer about the technical aspect from computer science, and then uh, a little bit shorter about the social science component. Um, our technical approach uh, is an uh, automated uh, text processing pipeline, essentially. Uh, we start with parsing news tags, we, we crawl them from online news website, we extract the relevant article data, we store it all in JSON files. Um, we then have a pre-processing and uh, frame detection framework, which will, I will talk about in a bit more uh, depth uh, afterwards. And lastly, uh, of course, we evaluated, and actually there is already uh, a work which has uh, been used with our previous version of this pipeline. Uh, and we, for this, uh, generated actually a uh, specific uh, test data set with uh, word choice by, um, uh, with bias by word choice and labeling, which was generated from um, media articles across the political spectrum. Uh, having some from the kind of extremely liberal, then some of uh, more uh, neutral uh, newscasters, and then some from the uh, very um, um, conservative spectrum of the of the news media. If you're interested in more details, I'll refer you uh, to the corresponding um, um, paper that was published uh, in the JCDL conference. Now. The interesting part, I think, maybe especially for the AI folks, AI folks that are following this talk, is actually uh, in the middle. So this pre-processing and frame detecting uh, part, and um, uh, we actually start with something uh, relatively out of the box, uh, which is we have to basically tokenize, sentence splitting, um, parts of speech, uh, tagging, parsing. Um, but then also named entity recognition, of course, and co-reference resolution. And for all of these things, uh, we, after some testing, decided uh, to rely on Stanford Core NLP exclusively, uh, where we always use the neural uh, models uh, if available, or else uh, we use uh, the default that they have. I have to say, in the beginning, we plan to do all of this, not just in English, but also on German news media. So far, uh, a lot of the uh, performance for these tools on languages other than English is not ideal. So we have so far just done it in English. And I mean, moving forward, this will be one of the big challenges to make, uh, to make it cross-language compatible. Um, we do this, of course, as a pre-processing part, but we're mostly interested in then is actually kind of identifying um, both candidate concepts and candidate uh, actors, so uh, named entities that are actually uh, named uh, or mentioned in these articles. Um, and we realized one of the big challenges uh, we're facing there was we had to identify cross document co references. So basically, the same broad concepts that people are talking about across different documents. And for this, there is no out-of-the-box uh, tools that work uh, really, really well. This is why we came up with our own uh, CDCR approach, which is uh, this project is led actually by Felix Hamburg uh, and uh, her, his colleagues. Um, and uh, what they do is they do uh, a candidate uh, extraction from the co-references, um, and then uh, they have a basically heuristic six-step uh, candidate merging uh, heuristic. And um, the idea of this is that uh, depending on what kind of uh, candidates you're looking at, so whether it's just a named entity or something more broad, uh, so something like uh, these surveillance planes uh, versus fighter jets or th things like this, so broader concepts, uh, even if you're trying to uh, recognize uh, the context dependent similarity between different uh, verbs that are basically used to describe the same uh, thing, um, they realize they actually have to do this in uh, steps. The technology for this is uh, described in that same paper uh, I mentioned uh, earlier. So these things are working, I have to say, uh, 
for now, the, this mostly works for noun phrases, but we're trying to extend this uh, beyond that. And this is ongoing. Now, the most interesting part for us is uh, the frame identification part. And we started doing this uh, also using heuristics. Uh, there's a lot of uh, dictionaries, especially in uh, behavioral psychology, but also in political science. Uh, people have tried to capture this uh, with relatively naive uh, dictionary approaches. So they basically define uh, potential frame properties that uh, people could use to frame the news. Uh, and then they try to detect them. Um, it turns out we tried this as well. It turns out this is really, really difficult and it ha doesn't have very good uh, performance. So in the end, uh, we now changed uh, uh, strategy completely. And we're going for a full uh, deep learning approach. Um, and uh, the main challenge here is actually to generate the data. Uh, so the annotated data, we need to train these um, deep learning classifiers. And I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail uh, in just a minute. But uh, I mean, I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A. Uh, it turns out that the naive dictionary approach, as for many other uh, tasks, are just not performing well enough, especially for, for kind of more context dependent um, uh, framing. And of course, in the end, uh, when once we have actually identified uh, different uh, across different articles, similar frames that are being used, we could visualize them, we could tag them in articles and so forth. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when I talk about the uh, experimental part for the social science uh, pillar of our project. Now, um, we started with uh, a slightly similar, uh, simpler task than uh, this full kind of frame property detection, which is target dependent sentiment analysis. Uh, this is something that has already been done uh, in other contexts. So there is these uh, restaurant uh, laptop uh, data sets where people have looked uh, at restaurant ratings uh, or things like this and trying to understand uh, the uh, sentiment uh, in those systematically. Um, those don't work out of the box well on news data, uh, which is not completely surprising. So we came up with a new annotation task, which follows basically the SEM eval uh, logic. And you can see an example of this. Uh, the idea is for now, we're doing this mostly at the sentence level. So you get to see a sentence. Uh, there is a, um, um, a named entity typically or an acting uh, object in that sentence. And we're trying to uh, get annotations for uh, how the person thinks that uh, this target was represented in the sentence. Um, and uh, we do this across many different sentences. Uh, so far, we've been randomly sampling them from news articles. Uh, we've also experimented with going to kind of more uh, the uh, uh, larger uh, several sentence level, um, paragraph level, but uh, these things tend to be a bit difficult, more difficult to annotate. And we can talk about this some more in the Q&A. Now, in our new TSC data set, um, we have um, about uh, 3,000 uh, instances for now, and this will be extended into the future. And you can already see that uh, Negative is much more common than positive, and most sentences are actually rated as uh, neutral. Um, as a first test, what we did is we used uh, a standard BERT model, um, actually with the state-of-the-art uh, TSC methods. I've listed the uh, three reference um, algorithms there. Uh, they were developed for laptop restaurant at this Twitter TSC data. And the only thing we actually did is we kind of hand-tuned uh, the BERT model uh, to work for our new CUC data set. And you can see, uh, compared to the base performance of the, uh, of the BERT, our hand-tweaked one is performing a little bit uh, better. We're using here um, average recall as the main measure, similar to the original uh, uh, task. You can see there's still uh, room for improvement, but uh, this was kind of our initial tests. Okay, if we now have a training data set that's specifically designed uh, for sentences being used in news and do a target dependent sentiment extraction for this, um, can we actually do it? And uh, how performant is this? And turns out we can actually uh, do quite okay. 
Um, there were a few challenges for this uh, kind of annotation tasks. Uh, these are mostly lessons learned from the last class, but we're now involved in the bigger one, uh, which I won't have time to talk about today. And I just want to share some of them with you because I think maybe there are people listening uh, for whom this is very interesting. Uh, on the one hand, and this is something that reviewers have brought up uh, time and again, as we have a very high class imbalance, but this is also in reality in news text. A lot of news texts, uh, the sentences are actually neutral, which is good. Um, but this means the classifier has actually to work on a very uh, class imbalanced uh, data set. Um, more importantly for us is that there were no academic benchmark data set uh, for the news domain, which is why um, University of Zurich is actually now funding me to generate such a benchmark uh, data set. And um, we do require relatively large data sets to train the neural models, as you know. And uh, one of the key challenges we, which we haven't fully addressed yet is that we actually have problems properly sampling across domain and news sources. So what I mean here is that we have enough representative sentences from different uh, news media on different uh, parts of the spectrum, but also not just, for example, for political news, but also for uh, other news more generally. So say it's about sports, about um, uh, other uh, societal issues, uh, things that are not necessarily directly related to politics. Um, why is this important? Uh, the main reason is that it turns out that the classifiers are otherwise extremely domain specific, and this is something that we would like to avoid. At the level of the coders themselves, we have some uh, key challenges. Uh, one is uh, when we ask coders for their view on how they think basically somebody who wrote the text uh, was, um, or what, what the attitude was towards the, the target in this, in this sentence, it mixes uh, with the um, attitude of the coder uh, themselves. And we've experimented around a bit with how exactly to pose the questions to minimize this, but this is something we probably have to just deal with. Uh, we've so far used mostly uh, MTurk workers in the US, uh, expert level, but this is uh, not the ideal uh, coder pool. They tend to have uh, very low attention rates and after a few tasks or one, even after one task, uh, performance tends uh, to decline a lot. Uh, the intercoder reliability is not very high for all coding tasks, which um, is a problem if you're trying to generate a benchmark data set. And uh, the main issue, uh, which is actually now something we have to solve when we go to broader, what we call frame properties, so not just uh, kind of sentiment towards a target, but uh, more specific ways in which this target is represented. Um, it's difficult to generalize actually beyond uh, just simple sentiment. Um, I wanted to use a few slides to just give you an outlook uh, or an idea of what we actually plan to do on the social science side with this. So assume we have a pipeline that can actually annotate news text for kind of the degree of uh, slanted language, we call it here, um, in the text. Um, Think of it as a news aggregator with bias indication, similar to allsites.com. Uh, you may be familiar with that site. And um, we start with a similar overview, so users can actually see uh, from different uh, segments of how neutral versus how slanted in one direction or the other uh, the text is actually presented. Um, and then they, when they can navigate to the article, the idea is that also at the article level, they get annotation for how uh, the uh, important concepts in the text are represented. Here we, as this example is for, again for this target uh, specific sentiment uh, or target specific framing. And uh, one example of how this could be annotated is very explicitly uh, using these color codes and uh, red actually shows the target whereas the gray shows how this target is described, just highlighting basically uh, for the reader directly uh, what are the important parts of the text. Uh, we've run a, a preliminary uh, online survey experiments, kind of as a pilot study, where we do a conjoint experimental design with the variation of showing an overview or not, annotating uh, the target or not, and then using three different annotation variants. And uh, all subjects see all three articles uh, from the uh, overview that I showed you earlier, one after the other. So they basically do three tasks. 
And they, there's questions about perception of the reporting in each article directly after they see each of them. And because we completely randomized this very carefully so that it's conditionally independent, uh, you can uh, get a clean inference uh, from these kind of experiments. The results of the pilot experiment are extremely uh, mixed. Uh, in the end, we only had about 100 subjects and it wasn't completely class balanced. But you can, I'm showing you just uh, this as, a, as kind of more of an illustration than as a real takeaway. Uh, you can see the effects uh, always of these three different annotation styles here as compared to the control and whether this affected, uh, for example, the perceptions of the bias that the journalists had in writing these articles, uh, perceived political extremeness uh, of the representation, for example, uh, in these articles or the impartiality uh, of the writer. And uh, you can see there's some effects, it's a bit mixed. And I wouldn't uh, want to overinterpret it, but this is something that we want to do when we scale this up uh, into a proper experiment. Um, we have a few uh, next steps coming up. One of them, or a few of them, are related actually more to the computer science part of the projects. So I've mentioned this already. Um, we're trying to build this new benchmark data set uh, for uh, studying frame properties in uh, news articles. I've received substantive funding from the University of Zurich uh, to do this. Uh, initially, we thought we would do this with uh, human coders uh, based in Switzerland and US, uh, potentially also in Germany. Um, we may or may not do part of that uh, still this way, but we might also still rely on online coders just because we need actually very large numbers of annotated uh, sentences or paragraphs. Um, I mentioned this um, cross-document co-reference resolution we're working on. Uh, this only works for non-phrases right now and has to be further uh, extended, improved. Uh, it's a heuristic in the end, so we also don't know how well it transports across domains. And we have uh, still general optimization of our neural modeling uh, to do. Uh, as you can see, for now, we've only done, done it really for this uh, target-dependent uh, uh, sentiment classification. We actually haven't done it for these more proper, uh, more complex uh, frame properties. And of course, in the end, what we want to do, and this is what our funder uh, is expect expecting from us, we want to deploy uh, this kind of news aggregator website where the tool automatically uh, annotates um, uh, the uh, way that these news are presented and uh, the way that the framework is built, uh, the, the, the axis in which we can basically show this degree or annotate these articles, show this degree of bias is uh, completely dependent on what we annotate in the data set. So if we think it's about you know, a neutral versus a positive or negative presentation of an article or whether this is about you know, taking politically uh, liberal stance versus a conservative stance, this is in principle all possible. It's just something that has to be coded um, as a uh, feature uh, in the annotation. Um, the, uh, the social science part, aside from this uh, simple um, experiment that I just showed you as a pilot, uh, will only start probably next year, so in 2021, where once everything else is finished, we plan to run a large scale experiment um, with the final visualizations we have, so basically with the final tool. And doing something very similar to what I just showed you, people will see uh, different ways in which the news is uh, presented, including annotation uh, of the content. And we want to see whether this changes the way in which people perceive uh, the um, substantive factual content uh, that is communicated. And hopefully, if possible, after deployment, we uh, want to do also live experiments with real website users. So they will be basically prompted to do uh, small mini surveys uh, as they're using uh, our tool. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, a lot of people who have contributed to this. This is uh, truly a team effort. Uh, the team of Bela Gip is uh, at the University of Wuppertal by now. He was previously with me in Constance. Um, and he has a couple of very good graduate students working for him. And I myself have a, a couple of RAs and a PhD student working for me uh, in Constance. Um, we're funded by the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences, which is actually the Academy of Sciences of the state of Baden-Württemberg, where I was previously working. Uh, and also University of Zurich and University of Constance have contributed uh, funding uh, to this project. 
that's all I want to report on today. I think um, we are well within time and I think we have a lot of times for Q&A. Um, I can't really see any one of you anymore, so I hope you're still all there and I'm looking forward to answering your questions.